Do you remember when you first learned how to ride a bicycle? Do you remember how excited you were? That feeling of accomplishment that you got? I am here today to invite you to spend some time with me to think deeply about how we learn and why learning in our schools needs to look and feel a whole lot more like the process we went through when we learned how to ride a bicycle. So let me ask you, how did you learn how to ride a bicycle? Whenever I ask people this question, I get responses like, I had training wheels, my dad gave me a good push down the hill, my mom held the back of the seat for me. But I encourage you to think back even further than that because the first time you started to learn about riding a bicycle was the first time that you saw your cousin or someone that you looked up to riding one. It piqued your interest, it made you ask questions, and immediately you started engaging in higher level thinking before you even realized what was happening. You were analyzing, assessing, and evaluating the situation, and you probably made the decision that, hey, that looks like a really fun thing to do. I might wanna try that. And so later on, when the time came to get on that bike for the first time, you were so excited, and so you knew you had to get on the bike, and that's, you know, trying to get on that bike is a little challenging, so someone probably held the bike for you, right? and helped you climb aboard, and then they got the pedal set just right, so you get your foot on there, you get your momentum, and then they held the back of the seat so that you could, you could then find your balance. And you probably fell to the ground a couple times, experiencing gravity before you even knew what gravity was. Right? I <laughs> hear some laughs. Um, so, the problem in schools is that we are so focused on knowledge acquisition and memorizing information that we forget about the experience of learning, right? We want kids to learn all of this content so they can pass tests at the end of the year. So what I want to do is have you put your imagination caps on. You ready? We're gonna pretend that far into the future, the only way that you're gonna be able to ride a bicycle and learn to ride one is in the school setting. And if teaching and learning continues to look the same that it does now, this is how you're going to learn how to ride a bike. First, I'm gonna give you a long list of vocabulary terms. Gear, sprocket, spoke, momentum, pedal, and the list goes on. You're going to have to define all of those words, and then you're gonna to have to study them because you gotta memorize all these words in order to ride that bicycle because we're gonna test you on them. And once we know that you know enough of those really hard words that maybe you've never heard of before, we're gonna have you read the user manual that tells you how to put the bike together, what all the parts do, and how, bike safety and all of that stuff. And you're gonna have a worksheet with questions and you'll go through that manual and you'll try to hunt and peck and find the answers to write them down on your worksheet. And you better study again because we're gonna test you again. And after we test you, we'll have a nice long lecture that you'll have to sit through and learn all about how riding a bike happens. Maybe we'll show you a couple pictures and you'll be taking copious notes and you better study again because we're gonna test you again. So go ahead and take those imagination caps back off. And now think back to when you actually learned how to ride a bicycle. Please raise your hand if you first had to learn a series of vocabulary terms before you rode a, rode a bike. <laughs> raise your hand if you had to read the user manual for the bicycle before you were allowed to get on a bike for the first time. Oh, and just give me a show of fingers. How many quizzes and tests did you have to take before you were actually alone? Oh, I see zero. <laughs> right. But this is what we expect of our students all the time. We expect them to sit and listen to all of these lectures and remember all of this information by the end of the school year. 
without really digging in to the context. So, a few years ago in the school district that I worked in, all of the administrators were challenged with shadowing one student or more for an entire school day. So, I changed all of my, um, all of my uh, appointments in my calendar and I went to one of our high schools and I shadowed a very bright young man in 11th grade. I started at the very beginning of the day when he got off the bus to the end of the day. And I paid attention and documented every time he was able to engage deeply in a learning activity. Every time he was able to ask or answer a question and any time he was able to engage in academic discussion with his peers. And over the course of his six hour day, four hours were spent sitting in a chair, listening to lectures, and doing worksheets. And then, when the dozens of administrators all got together to share our experiences from shadowing a student, a concerning trend came out that the majority of our students spent the majority of their day sitting like empty vessels while we poured information into them. So let's talk a little bit about research because that, that is, trend is concerning because we know from the 1960s that when you sit and listen to lecture, you're likely only able to remember about 5% of what you heard because we're not auditory learners by nature. And if you're reading informational text, you'll only remember about 10%. We know this decades ago. And then in 1956, Bloom, Benjamin Bloom, came out with Bloom's taxonomy with his colleagues. They studied the way that we engage in thinking, and they identified the different complexities that we think. And we use this in education, this taxonomy, or versions of it, to help us plan our lessons and our lesson objectives. But remember, I said we spend the entire year focused on giving students information. So I've taken the liberty of dividing this. We have higher levels of thinking, which are conceptual, really help us build our conceptual understanding. And we have lower levels of thinking that are about knowledge acquisition and recall, just recalling information. We spend so much time giving kids all of the information that they need that we very rarely get to conceptual understanding because this most often is looked at as a step-by-step -step process of thinking. But instead of reading a textbook summary, if you would actually read the first chapter of Benjamin Bloom's text from 1956, they explicitly explain that our thinking can happen in any order at any time and it can start in any place. Remember, when you rode the bicycle, you started by seeing an image, a concept, and you started evaluating, synthesizing, and you started at the top before you even knew what any of the terms were. So, I would like to take this and change this model. First, we're going to flip this triangle upside down. We're going to change the focus from the biggest part being on the bottom and the lower levels of thinking to now the biggest part is on the top. Conceptual understanding is most important here. But I want to take it a step further. I'm going to completely replace that image with a hot air balloon. So now the balloon represents our conceptual understanding and the basket represents knowledge acquisition. Now, the reason I'm changing this to a hot air balloon is because if you think about how a hot air balloon works, you first have to fill up the balloon with hot air, right? And then it will lift the basket up. So we know that you cannot build conceptual understanding without knowledge acquisition. They're both important, right? But you will never get to conceptual understanding if you only focus on the basket, on knowledge acquisition. So 
So now, once that hot air balloon is up in the air and it's rising and falling up over the hills and through the valleys, that represents us actually thinking in different orders of that taxonomy. And that's what we need to focus on in our schools. So you might be wondering, well, what does this actually look like in a classroom, right? So I'm gonna explain what it was like to be in my 2000, in 2006, to be a fifth grader in my classroom, teaching reading and social studies. When kids came to my class for those two subject areas, I had the content so integrated with each other that they thought they were coming to one class. What is this? Social studies or reading? I said, yes. It's both, right? <laughs> so my favorite, the reason you see the, the revolutionary, a revolutionary War picture up here is this was my favorite unit that we did. So we had to study the Revolutionary War in colonial times and students were reading the book My Brother Sam is Dead, a historical fiction novel, which is also a banned book. And we were also able to use that book as the context to help us understand how the events of the war took place and how they impacted both loyalists and patriots. We analyzed those things. We talked deeply about the human experience through this. Students engaged in activities that in simulations that help them actually feel and understand how someone could be so angry about something such as taxation without representation that they would actually revolt against their government. I challenged them with bringing in news articles from, from current, current events. And we actually looked at how the Constitution and the events during the colonial times and the revolution still shape and impact our society today. That's some pretty deep thinking. And I, my assessment showed that my students learned this at a deep level, but I didn't realize just how powerful their learning was until about three years later, I had some students from that same class come to me. They were upset that the school was going to completely get rid of their drama club. And so as we talked about it, all of a sudden one of the students said, hey, we should be like the colonists and start a revolution. <laughs> and so we, like you just chuckled, we chuckled a little bit. And then they all of a sudden started recounting all of these key concepts and key things that happened during the Revolutionary War that they had learned three years prior and started turning them into action steps that they could use in their current situation to try to save their drama club. Can you imagine how I was feeling? I was pretty darn proud. One, that they had remembered all that information, but just I was so amazed at how deep their learning must have been that they could take something like that and transfer it into something so relevant for them. I'm not the only teacher to ever teach this way. We actually do have some schools throughout the country that do focus on conceptual understanding for students, but they are far and few between. One example, just one, is the expeditionary learning model. In this model, students in, are engaged in interdisciplinary projects all the time. And in their projects, they are required to collaborate, to communicate in different ways, to use their creativity, to engage in critical thinking, and to build really important 21st century skills that will make them employable in the future. These schools are actually closing achievement gaps. And students in these schools tend to score an average of four to 12 points higher than their peers who are not in these programs. And that shouldn't be a surprise to us because as I said, we have decades upon decades upon decades of research on how people learn and it's time that we start to use that research 
in education. And now, as we're coming, trying to come out of this pandemic and find our new normal, we are in some of the most challenging times I have ever seen in education in decades. But I have to say that everything wasn't all bad that came out of this pandemic. When we had to switch to online learning, teachers quickly realized that all students had to do was close their computer if they didn't want to listen to lectures all day long. So teachers started doing some different things. They shortened their lectures, they prioritized their curriculum so that they were focused on the most important concepts that students needed. They started actually engaging students through total participation techniques and what that means is that they required every single student to respond to a question in a chat or in an app so that they could continue their lesson based on assessing where the kids were. And they also, um, they also started allowing students to complete assignments in their own way and in their own time to show their learning. We started seeing students who had been failing prior to the pandemic all of a sudden start getting straight A's because we were giving them what they needed. Can you imagine what a difference we could be making right now if we had just continued those practices when we switched back to in-school instruction instead of going back to business as usual, how many more kids we could actually be helping them prepare them for their future? We're at a crossroads right now in education. We have an opportunity because of this pandemic to actually make a difference and completely shift and transform education. And our kids cannot afford for us to squander this opportunity. We have to start to focus on that conceptual understanding. Our kids need it. There is no longer any reason we should be hyper-focused on knowledge acquisition because you can look anything up at any time on the internet. My son will tell you. <laughs> so, in order to make this transition and this shift to conceptual understanding, we first actually have to commit to it. And if we can commit to that and start to make some shifts, that'll be great because every one of our students deserves to have learning in their schools look and feel like the process of learning how to ride a bicycle. Thank you.